For this talk, Wandering Games, Melissa Kagan is a game studies academic and an incoming assistant professor of communication at Curry College. She's publishing game studies, convergence, game environments, and she serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Gaming and Virtual Worlds. Her book project, Wandering Games, is forthcoming. She holds a PhD in German from Stanford University. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for being here uh, at really uh, incredible week of Narrowscope Talks. Thank you so much to everyone who's shared their thoughts and their work. Uh, it's been so uh, fascinating and invigorating to see all of uh, this work um, in this incredibly difficult week. Um, thank you to the organizers for doing what they've done um, and for organizing such a such an incredible conference uh, in yeah the midst of all this. So um, and and thank you in particular to you for being here um, and watching this uh, talk uh, when there have been so many. <laughs> um, as uh, yeah, uh, so I'm I'm Melissa Kagan. Um, I'm an academic. Uh, I'm not a game developer like uh, so many of the excellent participants here. Um, and I am going to give a talk today about my book project. Uh, it's called Wandering Games. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to bring in some references to some of the work that has been done in this past week and also just work that's been done in general. Uh, I will talk some about violence in games. That's part of my project. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of that uh, in case that's just not something you want to think about right now. Uh, so with that said, I will get started. All right, um, so context. I've really only been working in this space, uh, this uh, ludic, sp this game space uh, for the last four years or so. Four years ago, I was graduating with a German PhD uh, and I was really interested in wandering opera. Um, I My dissertation was on the concept of the wandering Jew uh, and the wandering German. Uh, these are two very different mythic figures uh, in 19th century German literature, culture, music. Uh, the wandering Jew is this abject, tragic figure who is doomed to wander. Uh, and then the wandering German is this epic, adventurous, goes out, out into the world and uh, experiences amazing things and comes back home. Um, and I was really interested in how these mythic figures kind of get intermingled and then separated in Jewish German opera uh, in Wagner and after. Um, so this picture at the top left is a picture of Parsifal, which is a very important Wagner opera and it features this wander centrally. Um, and at the same time, I was directing all this opera. So the picture at the top right is a piece of uh, pedestrian performance that I did uh, in the square mile around the Stanford mausoleum, uh, basically, I set the opera um, in a bunch of different places around in the woods, uh, and then the audience would work their way through it, a piece of site-specific theater. Uh, and so in doing this work, I was getting increasingly interested in wandering, not just as uh, a, not just a, in terms of mythic figures or wanderers, but in modes of wandering. So what does it mean genres about wandering? Uh, what does it mean to have a piece of theater that wanders, a pedestrian performance, or a piece of literature, a piece of digressive literature, wandering music? Um, I was kind of running through the genre spectrum, uh, and at some point someone asked me, oh, are, are you aware that there are these games called walking simulators, which at that point, 2014 or so, was a pretty new concept. Um, you know, you might be interested in those. And I thought, well, yeah, I, I think I'd probably be interested in those. Um, so. I then started to look at walking sims um, and kind of before I realized it, I just switched fields and had gotten completely obsessed with this genre of play. Um, these are not really games that need an introduction in this crowd, but from the top left, Gone Home, Dear Esther, that's just a picture of a flaneur that fit in that part of my montage, um, Firewatch, uh, What Remains of Edith Finch, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, and The Path. Um, so some, I, I started working on these games and started thinking about um, particularly walking sims and gender uh, and how walking sims get gendered female. Um, some work was starting to get done on walking sims as queer, um, which I'll talk about 
as well. Uh, and I started to get really fascinated at how walking sims are usually defined by their lack. Their, um, the definition that I kind of cobbled together is that they're exploratory nonviolent games without points, goals, or tasks in which the undying first person player character wanders around a narratively rich space. Uh, so the term walking simulator, as we probably know, originated as this derogatory sneer intended to denigrate games that were less violent, less task oriented, or less difficult to complete, right? So there's this sense of lack immediately. They're not violent, They're, they don't have guns, they don't have tasks, they might not have win-loss conditions. There's something missing, um, which in part comes from their history of being modded. Um, but the more I thought about this, the more I wanted to rethink um, what walking sims or what I claim to think of as wandering games might be if we thought of them not as games that lack something, but rather as games, as works that are drawing from a vast intellectual history, um, which had been a lot of the work that I'd been doing in my PhD. Uh, so what began as this insult walking simulator has over the last decade become a catch-all term for games that are interested in alternative modes of expression and alternative considerations of embodiment, environment, orientation, and community. The genre now serves as a catalyst for debates about anti-game aesthetics, changing gamer demographics, and the radical potential of poetic spatial storytelling in video games. And in its attempt to slur a certain mode of play, the term walking simulator semi-accidentally tapped into something brilliant, the vast heritage and intellectual history of the concept of walking and wandering in performance, philosophy, pilgrimage, protest, and literature. Uh, so I thought about doing this project on these sort of classic walking simulators. I, that was originally how I was conceiving of it. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized I wanted to do something more like wandering games. Uh, which to me are games that bring this intellectual heritage explicitly into the discussion of walking and games. Uh, the works considered in this book project contain some elements of the classic walking sims of the 2010s, uh, but not all of them. Instead of a history, I'm interested in showing how this genre has inflected and continues to inflect some of the most interesting hybrid games of just the last couple of years. So most of my examples are 2018, 2019. Um, and here also, I'm, um, I was excited to hear Aaron Reed's talk yesterday on adventure games. I think we're getting at some of the same uh, questions, but from different directions. Um, so thank you for that talk. I look forward to digging into it more. These games are connected to the concept of wandering as a theme, a formal mode, an aesthetic metaphor, a player action, uh, and through troubling the concept of wandering, they tap into what I would consider some of the most crucial conversations going on in game studies today. Wandering in games exposes the multiplicitous possibilities of the simple human act of moving through space and complicates what, sh what such movement might mean within different game worlds. So to try and explain what I'm talking about, here are the central questions of this project. Uh, labor and capitalism. How does wandering in games attempt to reinstate a radical boundary between work and play? How can we understand the reaction against wandering games within gamer culture as something like a resistance to any game that criticizes the unthinking replication of capitalist success paradigms? If most games are premised on a capitalist success paradigm, wandering games aren't, and maybe that could explain where some tension is coming from. How are wandering games designed to provoke unproductive, contemplative, anti-capitalist play? Two, colonialism and archaeogaming. How does the construction of empty landscape in walking sims replicate a colonizer's understanding of space and place? How does the heroic monomyth of the wanderer and the ubiquity of exploration within narrative gaming invite colonialist game design? How does the negative space violence of an empty the landscape connect to broader conversations of violence in gaming. I will get into all of this more. These are just framing questions. Uh, question three, gender and sexuality. I've touched on this a little bit already, but how and why are wandering games often gendered female? And how does this gendering map onto longstanding discussions of female agency and presence in the public sphere? How do wandering modes queer traditional video game play? And finally, death and violence. 
how does the central tension of walking simulators? Traditionally, an undying player character traversing a dead, haunted world help us to understand ludic conventions, metaphors, and obsessions surrounding death and play. Taken together, uh, I am interested in subversions. Uh, the work, a lot of the wonderful work that's already been done in this space has been done on walking simulators as queer. Bonnie Ruberg, who I'll come back to later in this talk, has done work on um, walking and wandering in games as queer. Um, and I'm really interested in that. I'm really interested in their work. And I'm also interested in how you can expand that to, okay, yes, walking sims can subvert cis hetero patriarchal norms. And also they can be seen as against work, against colonialism, against death, against all of these other different conventions that we come to see as normal. Um, right, okay, uh, so, very ambitiously, I'm now about to take you through a drink from the fire hose sort of view of the chapters. I have limited myself to one slide per chapter. Uh, I'm more than happy to talk more about uh, any of these chapters, hopefully so that you'll be able to see where I'm coming. They are entirely made of pictures. Uh, all right. So uh, the introduction is basically an incomplete background about wandering as a concept before games, uh, before digital games, and then how those discussions and discourses get kind of imported wholesale, oftentimes implicitly, uh, into contemporary video games. And um, in some cases are very visible, uh, as for example, in this juxtaposition, and sometimes are less visible. Uh, so this, these images, uh, the, on the left, we have the very famous Caspar David Friedrich romantic painting from 1818, The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, uh, and then on the right, uh, the cover art, of course, of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, uh, which features two very similar figures and very similar uh, landscapes. Uh, so I do a bit of a survey of walking sims as a genre. I think I then zoom out a little bit and think about predecessors, um, a lot of which have been mentioned during this conference. So the digital game genres that developed the conventions surrounding ludic exploration, uh, and the embodied performative game genres that enable players, designers, and landscapes to co-create narratively rich spaces through which to wander. Shout out to that excellent panel on adventure last Sunday, uh, and Chris Przycki in particular, that was very cool work. Uh, I really enjoyed as well the talks from Brent Bailey on games as spaces, games as geometries from Gabe Pickett, also Aaron Reed, again, adventure. Um, and adventure games <laughs> as predecessors to this form. Uh, and then I zoom out a little bit more and sort of look across the 20th century in general, the array of artistic and activist practices related to wandering, uh, which are relevant to the development of walking sims, including 20th century performance art. So interactive and site-specific theater, the Situationist International, Capro's Happenings, uh, Marina Abramovich and Ule's The Lovers, Boal's Theater of the Oppressed, Tension sees when your performances. Uh, I also look a little bit at uh, digressive landmarks of literature that, uh, particularly modernist ones, that demand respect for meandering, purposeless, anti capitalist leisure. Uh, and then, third, an activist understanding of the connections between wandering and marching. When does wandering in a group turn into marching, occupation, resistance, protest? I draw from uh, Rebecca Solnit, Sarah Jane Servanak, Carla Wallace, Lauren Elkin, um, in particular, among many others. Okay, chapter one, late capitalism. This is a pun I'm very proud of, um, <laughs> needlessly so, but uh, late capitalism, I'm analyzing uh, Lucas Pope's brilliant game from the fall of 2018, uh, Return of the Overdead. So in Oberdin, uh, and these images at left are all screenshots taken from Oberdin. In Oberdin, you are an insurance adjuster who has been sent by the uh, East India Company to explore, to examine what happened aboard this ghost ship that has come back into port. It should have 60 people aboard. Instead, it has no one aboard. It has a lot of corpses, however. And so you use this watch uh, called the Memento Mortem 
uh, to find the corpses. And once you find them, you click the watch and it opens up the moment of each corpse's death. You then examine these scenes and through detective work and complicated logic puzzles, uh, you match the information of the corpses that you find to the logbook. And that image of the logbook is below. So you're asked, who is this? How did they die of every character, every corpse that's aboard this ship? I start out thinking of this uh, as a kind of semiotics of corpses. I'm interested in thinking about the corpse as a mediatized and archival object. Uh, and once I started conceiving of this game as an archive of corpses, um, it started to get really interesting to me. So I, I've done work before at thinking about how um, wandering uh, games, walking sims, a lot of them are uh, they're, they're archival adventures. You're working through big fields of different kinds of text and you're piecing all the pieces of text together uh, like a researcher in an archive. Uh, and Oberdin turns that upside down. Usually you're piecing through pieces of text and that either brings to life a body or a sort of a bit of presence. It evokes something like a person who wrote the text or said something or whatever. Um, and here it's the opposite. It's an archive of corpses and you're touching the corpses and trying to turn the corpses into text. So from there, I go towards uh, some thoughts about death and walking sims in general. They have a reputation as these really peaceful, ludic environments. Uh, oftentimes, that's a major complaint about them. But I argue that these games fully participate in the morbid enthusiasm for death and violence that so characterizes the history of video games. Uh, the difference is time. In so many games, you walk into a peaceful environment and you kill everything in it. Uh, and in Walking Sims, it's the opposite. You walk into a peaceful environment in which everything has mysteriously already died. Uh, and you try to piece it together and figure out what the hell happened and why, why everyone already died. Um, but they're not divorced from death. They are instead about exploring the aftermath of death rather than causing it directly. Um, one, uh, yeah. So I then consider this question of temporality more closely, um, illustrating how Oberdin states the player's desire to grasp at a moment of death and how the archival poetics of the game hinge on the mythical existence of that impossible moment when the living person transforms into an archival and archivable object. Uh, and finally, I conclude by discussing what that process of objectification means in the harsh capitalist world of Oberdin, a world in which every death, no matter how fantastic, how inflected with sea monster violence, uh, must eventually be reduced to a number in a ledger and nothing more. The, uh, so up in the right corner of each of these slides, I'm gonna post the um, uh, covers, the cover art of some of the scholars whose work is I'm particularly drawing from in each chapter. So this chapter, I draw a lot from Margaret Schwartz's Dead Matter, uh, Jennifer Malkowski's Dying in Full Detail, uh, and Amanda Phillips' work on mechropolitics, um, which is an article rather than a book, so I didn't put it up here, but read that too. All right, two, East Shade. I want it said flat out that I just love East Shade. East Shade is the coziest thing in the world. Uh, East Shade Studios, early 2019. Um, really beautiful game where you wander around being a traveling artist in this beautiful place and painting. You take out commissions for your paintings, you explore the whole island, you get to know everybody. It's so lovely. It's this perfect fantasy. Uh, of course, the precarious life of a wandering artist little resembles the fantasy of what that life might be. East Shade revels in this gap offering the player a fantasy tailor-made to soothe, soothe the particular fears of precarity uh, in 2019, 2020, uh, and doing so with such charm and panache that the player hardly realizes that it's happening. Uh, so this chapter looks at how this game is delivering a fantasy of late capitalist precarity. Uh, I start by jumping back to the 19th century and tracing the aesthetic sociocultural myth-making surrounding the wandering artist, a character who became increasingly important during the 19th century. I show how the player's response to East Shade's landscape also uh, 
goes back to a lot of the aesthetic theories that developed uh, during European Romanticism, that particular art movement. Uh, and then in addition to playing at the 19th century romantic ideal of the wanderer, I discuss how the player is also put into the role of that character's much more realistic cousin, the mid 19th century artisanal journeyman who migrated in search of work. Uh, the experience of playing East Shade is this constant back and forth between the, the dream of being a wandering artist and the reality of finding commissions and managing all of these different economies that you have to keep track of, uh, it, it, largely in a traditional RPG sort of way. Um, but when juxtaposed with the promise of the, the fantasy of just being a wandering artist and painting whatever you like, uh, it's really interesting how much of your time you spend, you know, building up your relationship with pivotal NPCs and making sure you have enough inspiration to paint the paintings that are on commission, even though maybe that's not what you wanted to paint and so on and so forth. So I do a whole section close reading these economic considerations that drive the player. Um, and I read their actions within the context of millennial anxieties about precarity, love, and labor. Uh, here, I'm drawing a lot from um, Ergen Bullet's A Precarious Game, The Illusion of Dream Jobs in the Video Game Industry, which just came out. Uh, super fascinating work on labor, precarity, uh, and the neoliberal instrumentalization of love and passion, the uh, dangerous promise that of the do what you love ethos and how it's perfectly designed to produce and reproduce a creative precariat. Uh, finally, I then consider Ishe the game as a labor of love of its programmer, Danny Weinbaum, and analyze how Ishade Studios embeds itself within these intersecting late capitalist ideologies as an independent game developer. That um, last picture there in the corner is taken from a Ishade Studios uh, press video a year into what would be a, um, a long, a lengthy five-year development process. Uh, and about solidly 10% of the video focuses on this bowl of ramen on, so Weinbaum is coding and then Weinbaum is making ramen and then Weinbaum is eating ramen and the shadows lengthen. And um, I, along with other um, pieces of, of press from Ishii Studios, I read this sort of performance of precarity and love and labor um, that mirrors a lot of the same themes that are going on when you play the game. Okay, chapter four, yes changed from the order to be chapters recently, but this is definitely still chapter four, Under Constraint. Here is where I'm reading a uh, brilliant, brilliant game, Tara Stone's Ritual of the Moon. This considers Ritual of the Moon as a queer feminist take on wandering under constraint. The player character is a powerful witch who has been banished from the entire earth and relegated to a tiny circle of movement, which she walks and rewalks daily. Each day, she conducts an identical ritual uh, and decides whether or not to protect the Earth today against this apocalyptic comet, which we see about to crash into the Earth. Every day, the player must remember to play, but is constrained to play for only five minutes at a time. So you have to play every single day for 28 days, but only for five minutes each day. It's a durational game. So when such constraints are placed around movement and then mirrored by the game forcing the player to have constraints around time. So when one is denied the chance to exert agency over space, to wander freely as the witch is in this game, what is left? I draw from Sarah Jane Servanak's, uh, the book furthest to the left, Wandering, Philosophical Performances of Racial and Sexual Freedom, to construct wandering as a metaphorical concept, not a physical one, the practice of which emancipates those to whom society gives no spatial outlet. Internal wandering, Servanek argues, rebels against an external order dedicated to the immobilization of black and female bodies. Following De Silva and Spivak, Servanek points out how wandering took on its enlightenment informed connotations of freedom only by defining itself in relation to the unfreedom of others, freeing certain people, in other words, only through the subjugation of others into non wandering immobility. I explicate Ritual of the Moon through this lens, showing how theorists in feminist game studies, queer game studies, disability studies, uh, help us to conceptualize repetitive steps in circles as a powerful and alternative mode of wandering. Uh, 
I also wanted to bring in how this game's notion of temporality uh, is really interesting. Uh, and I try to deepen it with, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really wrap my head around it until I had sort of thought through all of these different kinds of temporalities that are, that are at play in the game. Um, it becomes an increasingly complex meditation when seen as a game about multiple temporalities and existing at the node of multiple identity positionalities, a game in which female time, queer time, and crip time intersect. Uh, so in addition to Servanac, I'm drawing substantially from, from Bonnie Gruberg's video games have already been, sorry, video games have always been queer, uh, particularly their chapter on Walking Sims and Shira Chess's Ready Player Two. Uh, as well as quite a bit from Tara Stone, the um, game's developer, uh, who has also written substantially about the process. Um, yeah. Uh, also shout out here to Swinky's awesome presentation on second puberty, uh, which on, on Monday, I think, which was fascinating and really made me think about uh, time as an overlaying of different temporalities, temporality of puberty on top of temporality of 30 something hood. So yeah, thank you for that talk. Okay, 80 days, everyone's favorite, favorite Nariscope game. Uh, so this chapter um, is about decentering the explorer in 80 days. Uh, I'm thinking through three different ways of traveling through ludic space, uh, connecting each one to the heroic monomyth of the wanderer and the ubiquity of exploration within narrative game. Obviously exploration is not something new since Bartle, it's been, well, since way before Bartle, but um, exploration is one of Bartle's four player types. Um, we know that there's tons of exploration in games. What I'm interested in in this chapter is thinking through different types of exploration and how all are not equal when it comes to a colonialist outlook towards them. So in the first section, um, I'm drawing from Soraya Murray uh, on video games, the book in the right corner to show how narratives of progress and colonialism are woven inextricably into walking simulators. In this context, the player travels through as a colonizer with a predatory gaze seeking exploitable land. So the same way as in the first chapter, I am interested in thinking about um, walking sims not as nonviolent, but rather oriented with a different uh, kind of perspective towards violence after it. Um, here I want to think through, well, through, uh, through Murray, um, through Soraya Murray, I want to think through how perception of landscape that got imported from first person shooters um, means that a lot of walking sims are still perceiving landscape in a predatory, exploitative way. Um, in a, in a way that often goes under the radar and in some cases is problematized and subverted and not in fact the case. But in a lot of cases, it seems like what's happening is you're entering a space where you're not the one doing the, the killing, the exploiting, the colonizing, the taking over, but your uh, perspective on the space is still one of uh, taking and uh, looting, albeit the looting is, um, of knowledge, of text, uh, of images, of not, not in a sort of classic Lara Croft, go in and raid all the tombs sort of way. Um, so, right. The second way of traveling through uh, is 80 days, which does not do this. Um, 80 days decenters the protagonist and offers an experience of peaceably traveling through a complex world, a world that is much more complicated than the protagonist. Um, shout out to that UWM panel last Saturday, Stuart Multhrop, Scott and Bruner, Kelly Breivich, uh, Eric Kirsting, and Janelle Maligon for their fascinating playthrough of 80 Days on Saturday. Um, I love the idea of deconstructing 80 Days or trying to make all the wrong choices. Um, I find that so hard to do as a player, so I appreciate you uh, doing that, doing that work, some of that work for me. Um, but so, uh, Magna Giant has spoken uh, and written quite a bit about uh, the intention to invite post-colonial play by intentionally disrupting 19th century normativities, dissolving the player's expectations of class, colonialism, heterosexuality, 
and creating the expectation that the player is not the center of the world. They're traveling through a complex world rather than centered within it. I analyzed the subversive choice of a queer lower class player character, Casa Part Two, uh, while keeping sight of the fact that he's still a white European man. And I try to speculate on critical play of colonialist and post-colonialist works using uh, Mary Flanagan's Critical Play, that's the other book in the top left, uh, to show how ADDs provokes meaningful mental decolonization uh, and connects the disruption of gamer norms to the disruption of colonialist prejudices. Uh, here also, I, um, I, it's not a book cover, so I didn't put it on here, but Sam Cabo Ashwell is huge here too, um, and a source that I'm drawing from quite a bit. Uh, finally, in the third section, I turn to a hyper-colonialist board game based on the same narrative. Uh, and so this, this board game in the lower right-hand corner of this montage, uh, the, the requisite montage. Uh, so this board game is uh, the first Ravensburg board game. It was published in 1884, uh, and it is based on Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days, which was an incredibly popular novel that, that, <laughs> that decade. Um, and so this board game is, uh, I go into a little bit of board game history. This is a board game uh, that's based on the genre of goose games. Uh, happy to talk more about board game history if you're interested. <laughs> um, but basically it's the spiral game, nothing to do with Untitled Goose Game. Very sorry to report. Um, but it's the spiraling board and I argue that it uh, is hyper-colonialist, not just in its text and content, which is colonialist enough, obviously, uh, but it transforms spatial travel into time travel. The player is traveling through time rather than space. Each square on the board represents one day rather than one place through which one can travel. Uh, and in this way, colonialist progress is made ludologically inevitable. Um, believe it or not, in this era, uh, dice and the, the whims of the dice were uh, unacceptably subversive or could be. With enough bad luck, with enough bad dice rolls, maybe the player would not land on the space that they wanted to invade or take over whatever it was in the diegetic parlance of the game. Um, so by, transform by, by taking that option away and saying, no, 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 each square is just a day rather than a place, um, conquest is inevitable. Uh, because time will pass and the player will continue around the board. So these three different ways of wandering through game worlds as exploitative colonizers or prospective colonizers, as curious travelers, and as inevitable conquerors illustrates how different kinds of ludic exploration reflects, can reflect different relationships towards coloniality and wandering through space. Um, and shout out to Rebecca uh, Harwick's notion of the journey as a story engine yesterday. Um, that was a really interesting talk. I will have to keep thinking about that, but I obviously <laughs> found that pretty relevant and I need to keep thinking through what we're talking about with it. Okay. All right, next chapter, Heaven's Vault. Ugh, I loved Heaven's Vault too. Um, so this chapter, analyzes Heaven's Vault to show how language can create spaces for confronting death and colonialism through play. Basically, I'm trying to think of language as a space, um, which is something that I imagine would be very popular with this crowd. Um, but in Heaven's Vault, I think there are you know, a lot of games that one could consider for exploring this topic. Um, excuse my use of the word, word explore. Uh, but in Heaven's Vault, um, I think it's particularly interesting because of the so many different kinds of language uh, that are available and even required from the player. So in Heaven's Vault, the, uh, an archaeologist, Aaliyah, roams around the nebula following the traces of a missing person. The more she learns of Janiki Renba's disappearance, the deeper she gets into the mythology of the nebula, a universe of looping time, abused robots, fallen and forgotten empires, and a language called ancient, which is inscribed on short phrases uh, on many of the artifacts that Aaliyah encounters during her travels. With each new moon visited and each inscription decoded, the player gains a little more knowledge about 
the language and is thus able to understand the past and its erasure a little more completely. The knowledge of encroaching death in the forgotten past and maybe the near future because of the time loop mythology or religion of um, this game gives weight and meaning to the player's understanding of the game's language. Uh, there's the threat of all-encompassing imperial power, which is made really manifest in the way language works, which I'll get into a little bit more in a second. Uh, and there's, so by conceptualizing language in each of these, or in, in this game as a space co-created by player and game, I draw from theorists of digressive literature to posit the player as an anti-colonialist wanderer in a world made of a dozen different types of language and through the way that they navigate that linguistic space, those linguistic spaces and knit them together through their digressive passage through it, uh, they're doing this anti-colonialist work. Uh, so what do I mean by this different, this space of all of these different interimbricated languages? So first of all, there are the two languages in the game that are uh, so ancient in uh, the lower left corner, there's an example of written ancient, it's also spoken occasionally. Uh, and then there's English or imperial, which is rendered in the game as English, the language of Ajax, the empire of the game. And that's written in many different ways, both uh, diegetically and extra diegetically, and also occasionally spoken, usually in descriptions of different planets. So that's a whole lot of language just from the get-go that the player has to uh, learn how to understand and interpret. Um, the main mechanic of the game is translating the uh, glyphs of ancient into English. Um, so one is attuned to thinking about language from the beginning. And uh, the player, as a player, you're sort of making charts and uh, making inferences about what the grammatical systems of this language might be. And you're thinking, oh, okay, I think that glyph means it has something to do with time, or that glyph means it's a state of being verb, or, you know, oh, that's definitely just a verb, but it's not a state of being verb, et cetera. Um, so you're thinking about language. And then in the process of playing the game, there's all of this cultural code switching um, that Aaliyah does. Uh, they're switching between the speech on the colonized worlds where the player character, where Aaliyah was born, the player character. And then there's the speech of empire, which she uses professionally uh, in the university where she works. Except it's not that clear a dichotomy because of course she is, um, in some cases her specific cultural knowledge is what cracks the code. It makes semantically legible something that would have been incomprehensible to something else. So she's kind of in her work, she's going back and forth between different kinds of literacy and legibility um, that all of which are necessary to her solving um, these translation um, puzzles. There's also technical kinds of reading and writing, which in the metaphorical sense of a computer reading or writing a piece of code, how is it different for a machine versus a human to read a, read a piece of text? And this then becomes a question of identity as well, uh, since one of the main characters in the game is a robot with sentience, personality, emotions, um, quite uh, <laughs> quite an intense personality, actually. So the ways in which Six can read something or a machine can read something from Six are different than the ways that Aaliyah can read and can be read. In navigating these identities and these various kinds of text, the characters make manifest the many kinds of linguistic fluency, legibility, and communication that the game offers, and which the player, too, has to learn how to navigate and read. Uh, shout out here to Judith Pintar's talk on metahodologies on Tuesday, uh, which is absolutely relevant uh, for both literally in terms of, um, there's a map at the top right here. Uh, more and more of the map becomes clear as the player learns more which is you know, common in a lot of games. And then also as Aaliyah learns more of the language, as the player learns more of the language, it becomes increasingly clear what pathways are possible to take in navigating through that space uh, and to contextualize what it means to be moving through the language and through the map, which in some parts of the game actually map right onto each other. Um, in ways I won't say because I don't want to spoil, uh, but sort of the map and the language are uh, at least at one point, one and the same. So I also wanna make a note about digression, um, which I'm still working on 
exactly how to sort of connect this with the other themes of the chapter. But in literary studies, a common way of understanding digression is to stave off death. Since Tristram Shandy, really since Scheherazade, probably farther back, but those are not my millennia, uh, the notion that if one keeps talking, keeps writing, death can't take you. And so the result is digressive literature, because you've just continuously written and talked and talked and talked until, um, well, you can't stop. You, you can't stop. Uh, so this doesn't come up as much in games, which are a, um, which are an art form that are more explicitly based on digression. We think about choice and branching and narrative form um, much more directly um, than you do in something like a piece of, in, in literature, digressive literature is oftentimes this very experimental thing. Um, it's not the, nor the sort of plot arc norm. Um, but I think that, it, so even if it doesn't carry the same weight in a, as it does in a piece of non-ergotic text, thinking about digression in Heaven's Vault um, and in Wandering Games in general, it, reading it through the idea that digression is a way to stave off death leads to some interesting um, realizations. Uh, the uh, text that I'm drawing from here, uh, one of the texts that I'm drawing from is Astrid Enslin's Literary Gaming, um, particularly the work on Detournement and the situation is international and digression in, um, in those arenas. Uh, and shout out to Jordan Jones Brewster for that really excellent, we should talk, talk, uh, I can't wait to play it. The, I mean, that sounds super fascinating how the subtleties of language and the sentence spinner change the relationship, change that world. That's, uh, I'm really excited to see how that works. So thank you for that, um, for that talk. And then the final chapter, um, Death Stranding, because of course it is. Uh, Death Stranding is a game where the player wanders around a post-human, post-apocalyptic, post-death world. Uh, the player is made hyper aware of the particularities and limitations of their body as they remap and reattune themselves to their physicality throughout the game. In Death Stranding, Sam, lower left, burdened by many, many packages, which unlike in many games are actually visualized as uh, packages, not just gone into an invisible tiny backpack. Um, but you actually need to manipulate those objects onto Sam and um, be aware of how the weight of them changes uh, his ability to move through the world. So he roams the devastated landscape of what was once the US, delivering packages to a bunkered down populace and connecting each city to a network, which is basically the internet. The game is, uh, it, it, the, the game is also infest or the, the world is also infested with these uh, ghostly creatures called VTs uh, as pictured in the top left. Um, this is a world where we're in some sort of post-death moment where death doesn't really exist. Sam cannot die. Sam goes into an sort of afterlife mode and then comes back. Um, Sam's entire body because of this ability is uh, capitalized on, shall we say, um, his, his blood and his urine and his, all of his exertion is sort of monetized in the fight against these ghost-like creatures. So Sam is kind of between life and death. The world is between life and death. So many of the characters are crossing back and forth across that boundary. Um, and the experience of playing the game um, is ostensibly so the game is ostensibly about, you know, connecting each, uh, each bunker and going between, you know, one task and another task. Uh, and to me, that read as a smokescreen to try to make the game commercially legible. Uh, I think it's really about the horror of in-betweenness. He is always on the move. He's always in the process of wandering from one place to the other, albeit with a kind of goal to keep sane. Um, although there are plenty of opportunities not to have a goal and to sort of roam the landscape. Uh, it's about journeying, being caught in between, suffering the horrors of various kinds of in-betweenness. Uh, so here I'm trying to 
you know, not put a bow on it, but trying to sort of bring together connections to discourses that have woven through the book, uh, post-colonialism, post-capitalism, a post-death player character trying to make sense of a dead world, post-capitalism, but in some ways it's it's more like, it's like late, late capitalism in this game um, because of all of this monetization of every instant of every character's, or of Sam's in particular, life um, and physicality. Um, and I'm drawing most explicitly here uh, from Alinda Chang's um, magisterial book, Playing Nature, which came out, I think, last fall, um, and especially the last chapter there on uh, collapse and permadeath um, and kind of the ecologies of games. Uh, so that's a bit of a grim note to end on. And yet, uh, I'm basically ending there. I'm hoping I get to a bit more of a hopeful place uh, by the time it actually, you know, I, I'm actually concluding the book. So the book is, is um, under contract, but I can't quite say where yet. Um, it should be out probably towards the end of 2021, hopefully if things go well, although who has any idea at this point. Um, and yeah, um, I'm really open to any thoughts or concerns or um, questions or sort of ideas about where, uh, where else it could go or um, what you think about it. Um, thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you so much to, uh, I, I must shout out, even though I don't quite know what to say, because it was just so breathtaking, uh, the keynote from last Friday, almost a week ago, um, Slavier Nelson's uh, keynote, um, Slavier Nelson Jr., who, um, whose words were just incredible, um, and I really appreciated them. So thank you very much for that. Okay, any questions? Hi, everybody. So I want to remind you, please use question in all caps to help us find it. Uh, I will tell you, Melissa, that people are very excited for your book. Uh, so uh, they really want it now. So keep going. Uh, there was a whole lot of, so I will say you got a large number of compliments for connecting to a lot of other talks. People were very excited that you were making connections between a number of different things. Um, so, and I will just pause and wait for questions. So as I'm pausing, I will say I personally, um, as another scholar, wrote down a number of sources that I did not know. So I'm excited to dig into that myself. Awesome. Yeah, I goes without saying, but really anything I put up on a slide here, I think is brilliant and should <laughs> be read cover to cover. <laughs> so yeah, cool. And it's all worked for the last couple of years, which um, also I think speaks to just how much incredible work is coming out of game studies right now. Um, not to say that there wasn't incredible work before now, but really in the last couple of years, there's been such a wealth um, of, of scholarship uh, that's I'm really excited about. Okay, so first question. Uh, question, do you have, it? oh boy, do you have any book recommendations that didn't make it into this presentation? Um, <sighs> yes. Mm. Sure, let me just look at my whole bookshelf, which is currently on the floor. Um, uh, feminism in play. Um, I, this isn't a games one specifically, uh, but um, Gretchen McCullough's Because Internet, if you haven't read that, it was super fascinating. And I drew a lot of those ideas in the, uh, this chapter, the, the Heaven's Vault chapter on sort of language spaces uh, and thinking about language generationally, um, Mia Consalvo and Christopher Paul's real games, um, uh, Gaming at the Edge, Adrian Shaw. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are a lot more, um, but I'm gonna have to give you a reference list. <laughs> yeah, so I, was, I also wanna encourage people um, as, as we get to, towards wrapping up, definitely ask on Discord because that's a great place to, to post links to things as well. Okay, so next question says, what is your take on games that mix wandering and puzzles, like The Witness, and on a similar scale, The Talos Principle? Um, yeah. A good question. Um, so... I would say that to me, the most, just what I gravitate towards um, are games that do not have puzzles. 
uh, because I kind of because of this lack uh, idea that I started. I'm, I'm really interested in what you have when you kind of strip away conventional kinds of play and, and games. And I would put puzzles into that category. Not because I don't like puzzles, and I, I really liked The Witness, um, but because um, I just, I want to see what happens when that's, when you don't have those sort of crutches to lean on, when you have to um, I really, I really like when games sort of try to be boring. Not that I would say that any of these games try to be boring. I think what's so interesting is that here it's like they've kind of drawn out some aspects of walking simulators, but they've still sort of maintained something like a semblance of traditional fun. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really interested in games that are just not trying to be fun or that, you know, try to gravitate away from traditional ideas of fun, which is where I would put puzzles. Um, that said, I, I mean, I do like playing them, but I think I was, I'm was i trying with this project to kind of move away from that kind of play. So as a follow-up question to that, um, someone compliments you and says, fantastic talk, uh, and then says, uh, they wonder if there's a dynamic between movement and stillness and wandering games and are you thinking about that in your own work? Totally. Um, yeah. And for that, so both Alenda Chang and Bonnie Ruberg write on slow games um, and slowness in games. Uh, Ruberg in the context of uh, slowness as a kind of queering of play. Um, and um, yeah, I think speed is not as much something that I'm working on in most of my chapters, although I do talk about it in Under Constraints, um, where the witch is quite slow and quite still. And I think we could also theorize the witch in Ritual of the Moon as made immobile in the, um, you know, 23 and three quarter hours that you're not playing the game every day. Um, so I kind of think of that as a kind, you know, what is the <laughs> Toy Story style? You know, what is the, what are the characters in the game doing when you're not activating them? Um, so in that sense, I'm thinking about stillness. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I'll think about it more. I, for the <laughs> most part, have not been considering it as much. And I think in part, it's because queer game study scholars have kind of been uh, working in that space. And I'm like, ah, that's so great. I should think about other things because they've got that covered. <laughs> So I, I guess connected to that, uh, sort of speaking at games and scholarship, someone asked, are there any good VR walking sims? Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there are. I don't work on them. But I'm sure there are. Sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, so someone asks... Do you see any conflict or tension between linearity and wandering? As an example, a game like What Remains of Edith Finch has a linear story and you can only experience the different vignettes in a set order, but you also mention it in your examples of wandering games at the beginning. So I guess tension between linearity and wandering. Yeah, so I don't think a game has to be multicursal in order to be a wandering game. Um, I think it can be linear. Um, what I'm getting to when I'm talking about digression is those instances where it's not linear, um, but it doesn't have to be not linear um, in order to uh, be a wandering game. Um, although I can see, you know, where you're coming from with that because it would be like, well, wandering, of course, like, you know, the path, like you have to be able to just sort of, or not just the path, it's just the one that came to mind, you know, you have to be able to go anywhere and do anything and kind of wander about. Um, but yeah, I, 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 my answer to that would be that it doesn't have to, wandering games can be linear um, because I'm thinking of wandering not just as digression and sort of voluntary movement over anywhere one wants to in a space, but as it can be other things too. It can be a state of mind, a kind of internal wandering, a kind of um, meditative, space, so if, some, if you go out for a walk in the same way in a labyrinth, say, um, in a churchyard, that's a kind of wandering, as I'm theorizing it, um, even if it's a linear path. 
that you're taking. So connecting back to an earlier question, this question asks, or the questionnaire asks, I guess, how about idle games? How do they relate to wandering games? Um, so first of all, I think there's definitely going to be some overlap in terms of the anti-capitalism, um, you know, universal paperclip. Uh, and cookie clicker, and you know, these games where it's like they're creating wealth for you, uh, even when you're not there. Um, but I guess, yeah, I don't know if I want to stand behind this, but it's almost the opposite. Um, like an idle game, because it's like the machine is like doing the capitalist thing for you, and you're just kind of watching. Um, it's it's different from putting you in the position of sort of like you're in, in, in Oberdin where you're like, you have to earn your, your wealth and maybe at, uh, in this, in these immoral ways. Um, but, uh, but you personally, like it's sort of, it's on you. It's very individualized. And I, I, I see idle games as much more externalized. Uh, they're not, um, they're sort of something else. Some other entity is doing it. Um, you're this interpassive, um, Watcher, you know, you're you're. It's something much more similar to YouTube or um, or Twitch, where you're you know interacting in some way, but in a lot of ways you're really interpassive, um, which is a Paolo Rufino and Sonia Physic. Thank you for these questions. These are very good questions. I'm thinking about VR walking sims and wondering why I don't know any of them. So thank you for that question and all of them. So someone asked, sort of related to this, uh, they're really interested in using augmented reality for wandering, but would that potentially repurpose public spaces and be considered taking? For example, Pokemon mm -hmm. Go with events drawing large crowds to parks. Yeah, I think it's all in the way that you do it. Um, occupation for a cause is only colonialist or taking or exploitative if the cause is. Um, I don't think it is necessarily so. I, I think there are ways to do it that are not that. Um, and I think actually repurposing public space for art and play is a great way to push back against privatization and late capitalist occupation of space. But yeah, good question. I don't think it would necessarily be taken, but I don't know about the specifics of, you know, what you're considering. Um, I don't think Pokemon Go is. I, I, I mean, Pokemon Go obviously participates, or it doesn't participate. Pokemon Go, you can run into problems because it abuts other systems. So a, a Black person trying to, you know, go out and play Pokemon Go is going to run into systems of oppression in a way that a white player will not. Um, that doesn't mean that Pokemon Go is in and of itself exploitative. It is, is, is an abutting an exploitative system and running into problems because of that. Okay, so we're just about time. So I think that's it. I want to remind people we can head over to question and answer in the Discord for more of this. This has been really great. And thank you very much, Melissa, for closing us out. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody. Bye. Yeah.